Welcome back from the break. And just to let you know that this discussion is in English, but it's interpreted in French and Spanish. I can see that many of you are tweeting. So please do carry on using the Twitter handle at Gamak underscore org. And of course the hashtag prevention pays off. So before the break, we were looking at addressing hate speech and preventing discrimination in the European context. We're now going to look at the same subject in the international context. And it's my pleasure to hand over to the moderator for that discussion, the chair of GAMAC, Silvia Fernandez de Guerendi. Silvia, the floor is yours. And please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And uh, welcome to all participants to this second panel. As indicated already by Claire, we have had a first panel on exactly the same theme, a theme on the European context. And now we will look at the same, uh, the same uh, theme, addressing hate speech and preventing discrimination begins at home, good practice from national mechanisms worldwide. And here we will focus in particular on the Americas, Africa, and the Asia Pacific. Uh, this panel, like the previous one, will showcase conceptual approaches, normative frameworks, and good practices in these regions. Now I would like to extend my warm welcome to our very distinguished uh, panelists, whom I'm pleased to, to introduce. We will start with Mr. George Amo. Uh, I'm sorry if I don't, I'm not going to be pronouncing your names very correctly, but uh, he's the executive secretary of the Ghana Peace Council, who will speak on behalf of the chairman, Reverend Dr. Ernest Adu Yafi, who could not join us today. I would like to thank everybody at the Ghana Peace Council for its long time support to GAMAC. Then we will go into my own region with my old friend and strong supporter of human rights protection and promotion, Eduardo Bertoni. Eduardo is the representative and coordinator of the Instituto Interamericano de Derechos Humanos, the Inter-American Human Rights Institute. And uh, last but not least, we will hear from Professor Vitit Muntarborhorn. Vitit is Professor Emeritus of Law at Chulan Lokhom University in Bangkok, Thailand. And among other mandates, he's a former special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Cambodia. So let me thank you, Vitit, as we are all very pleased to have an expert such as you, who has served several UN Human Rights Council special procedures. We are very pleased to have you here in this panel. So why well, we start with George. George, violence before, during, and after elections have threatened some African countries. The Ghana Peace Council mobilized and supported efforts that led to the adoption of a presidential elections peace pact for Ghana. Yeah. Can you share some of the key activities carried out by the Peace Council's work to prevent elections related hate speech and violence during the, elect the general elections of December 2020? All right, uh, so thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Madam Chair, uh, very happy to see you. I think it's the first time that we are meeting. In Uganda, I'm not sure I met with you. Uh, <laughs> the Peace Council uh, was set up in response to protracted and violent conflicts in, in some parts of Ghana, particularly the northern part of Ghana. And that was somewhere in 2002 when uh, the overlord of a, a prominent um, traditional area was, was murdered together with some 40 others. Uh, so the mandate of the Peace Council as indicated in the Act, Establishing Act, Act 818, 818, is to facilitate and develop 
the mechanisms to prevent, to manage, and to resolve conflicts. The end of it all, the mandate seeks to ensure sustainable peace in, in Ghana. So uh, when the Peace Council was established uh, as an administrative a structure in 2006. Elections were very close. 2008, there was an election. And we realized that one of the things that led to the unfortunate death of the king and others was hate language. People used the media as a platform to vent hate speech against opponents, either political opponents or religious opponents, particularly religious or political opponents. So it became an issue. And the Peace Council at the time, led by uh, His Eminence Cardinal Pierre Texan, who is now in Italy, uh, who is a Catholic, uh, really mobilized people to ensure that the elections of 2008 went on without much difficulties. So in 2012, the Peace Council had received a legal backing by an act of parliament I just mentioned, Act 818. And that gave the Peace Council that legal authority you know, to mobilize. And one unique thing that distinguishes our Peace Council is the fact that out of the 13 member board, which constitutes the Peace Council, eight of them are from religious groups in the country. Religious institutions which have influence and who can, for example, bring their influence and credibility bear on, 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 on their constituents. And also in 2012, the Peace Council together with its partners decided to introduce the Peace Pact as one mechanism to preempt and prevent violent conflicts before the 2012 elections. So it was held in the second city of Ghana, Kumasi, where the Menshia Palace, a prominent chief together with the Peace Council, rallied all the presidential candidates to sign on to the peace pact. It worked and it became a precedent. So in, in 2016 elections, uh, Ghana thought that this is a good lesson that we have to carry on. And we did that again. But before the 2016 elections, knowing very much how much hate speech, hate language, hate conduct can affect the outcome of the elections, the Peace Council decided to go to all the 275 constituencies in the country to press home the idea of, non, of nonviolent uses in responding to our conflicts. So uh, it, we did that. And we believe that it really mobilized Ghanaians against hate speech and we had a successful elections in 2016. So in the last year's election, 2020 elections, I mean, the Peace Council once again went to all the 275 constituencies. Yeah, Ghana consists of 275 political constituencies. And the Peace Council touched base to all these areas to ensure that we drum home the message of nonviolence. And we succeeded. So uh, the elections was held on the 7th of December. On the 4th of December last year, the Peace Council once again brought together, this time not all the candidates, but the two main contenders, the candidates of the National Democratic Congress, who is now the opposition leader, and the current president, Nana Adudam Kakuku Akufuado, and they signed on to the Peace Pact. And we believe that it really, really prepared the ground for the outcome that we also. Uh, so uh, we have been working through our partners. We targeted the youth as well. 
particularly we, we believe that they can be radicalized through hate words, hate speeches, etc. So we targeted them and it really, really worked for us. Uh, so I think uh, for the opening, um, I think my time is up. Uh, the Peace Council, in the past three general elections in this country, has ensured that it reached out to the security agencies, the journalists, the religious leaders, the traditional leaders, the youth, and the political leaders. And it has really done a lot of difference in the elections of this country. And the records are there. We, we will not say that we contributed 100% to the election outcomes of the elections in the country, no. However, we believe strongly that the Peace Council contributed a lot to ensuring the outcomes of the past three elections that has lived the life of the Peace Council so far. Thank you. Thank you very much for this extremely concrete example of one, how hate speech can indeed uh, provoke radicalization and violence. And second, a very concrete form of countering this by asking all of uh, the relevant ac actors to sign up to this pact. This is extremely important, extremely important. And you have also focused on, of course, you mentioned all sectors of society and, of course, the, uh, the political uh, opponents that need to sign. Yes. But also the, that you have, like uh, in, 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 in previous panels, you have also stressed the importance of targeting the youth. Uh, in this effort. This is extremely, yes. extremely important. Thank you for this. And we will come back because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions on this extremely interesting initiative. I go now to yeah. the uh, another continent. I go to the Americas with Eduardo. Eduardo, um, we understand that uh, the, uh, there is these precautionary measures of the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights that serve to protect individuals or groups of individuals who are at risk to prevent irreparable damage. Can you provide us examples from this practice in relation to preventing hate speech against individuals or group of individuals? Well, or, uh, yeah. oh, sorry, yes, or provide good practices from national prevention efforts in the Americas to tackle hate speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Silvia, for, for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be part of this conversation. And I am glad that you had uh, also the, the question about uh, domestic uh, practices. Uh, let me start saying that uh, some years ago, uh, after being special reporter on freedom of expression at the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights and the Organization of American State, the Office of the High Commission, uh, Office of the High Commission of Human Rights at the UN, uh, asked me to do some sort of assessment on how Article 20 of the um, ICCPR uh, that include uh, the problem of hate speech uh, has been implemented in the Americas. Uh, so, uh, and that was part of uh, the process of what uh, ends in what we call today the Rabat principles. Uh, so we were experts coming from different parts of the globe uh, doing an assessment on how countries in each of the regions are coping the problem of hate speech. Um, frankly, the findings, uh, the findings uh, in my old piece are, th I think, that are still, uh, you know, important, um, and, and and that can show you and, and the audience uh, some practices coming from the uh, region, particularly the Americas. Uh, we can say that in, in, in trying to uh, cope with hate speech, and, and remember one thing, and one of the problematic thing is that hate speech, it's speech <laughs> in some way. And because it is speech, and we have strong provisions in preventing censorship, for example, sometimes it's very, very complicated to deal with this problem. Of course, under the Inter-American System on Human Rights, uh, there is a strong standard explaining that hate speech is not covered by freedom of expression, but how we are going to determine 
what is hate speech and what speech is not hate speech and is only political opinions or something like that. Because this is a problem because it could be used as a tool to censor uh, minorities, to censor vulnerable groups, to censor opposition. And this is some things that we, we saw in our region. So uh, I understand, I mean, that I, mean, I, I want to be clear, hate speech is not under you know, the protection of freedom of expression, but the problem is what is hate speech? Uh, in the Americas, uh, there are two, two, tip, two, two, two specific models, if I may say, to cope with this problem. One is the punitive model, the other is a non-punitive model. The punitive model is uh, related to, uh, I would say, three different uh, topics. One is including hate speech as a crime in criminal codes. The second is including hate speech uh, in criminal legislation, but not specifically in, in criminal codes, for example, in anti-discrimination laws. The third one is including sanctions in administrative legislation. And this is important today because administrative sanctions, uh, sanctions or even regulations, particularly with the problem that we are facing today in global platform or in media platforms, uh, you know, running in the internet, is something very, very complicated and it is an ongoing discussion in, in, in the region. The non-punitive uh, model um, is, 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 is a way that some countries uh, are trying to cope with this problem. Uh, and particularly, and on, on more specifically, is uh, working on public policies uh, that foster a non-criminal non solution. And, there I include what my, my colleague uh, that spoke uh, recently just said, um, target the youth and education. So there are some programs in, in some countries that are trying to promote you know, non-discrimination practices, try to explain the problem of, uh, of hate speech uh, and how hate speech can impact in the real world in ordinary people. And I will finish with something related to the Inter-American Commission Human Rights and Precautionary Measures that it was your first uh, question, Sylvia. Uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, I, I would say, I, 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 I might st start saying that the Inter-American System on Human Rights, both the court and the commission have a, a system for preventing uh, you know, damages that are irreparable damages. At the level of the court, you have the provisional measures. At the level of the commission, you have uh, precautionary measures. The name change, the body changes, but the goal is exactly the same. Specifically on the case of hate speech, uh, I would say that the Inter-American commissions specifically did more uh, public statements or press releases or uh, include and the, their their concern the concern of the commission in the in the in in, in press releases on in, in in specific reports than doing precautionary measures i remember for example in 2017 if i recall correctly that the inter-american commission on human rights did a very strong uh, statement against a uh, hate speech and uh, in, in the case of um, violent uh, demonstrations in the US, particularly in Virginia. Uh, you can find this, this strong statement calling the, the government to do something to prevent, to prevent um, um, you know, a hate speech practice, hatred, uh, you know, actions. And, and this is something that is under the concern of the Inter-American Commission, but at the same time, the concern is not using measures that under the title of hate speech can prevent legitimate speech, legitimate expression, and at the end of the day, censor vulnerable groups, minorities, or even political oppositions parties. And I will stop there, Silvia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. And thank you for bringing us to the beginning, I would say, because indeed yesterday we started by saying, well, what is hate speech? And, uh, and the problems of, well, the lack of a, a globally recognized definition of hate speech and how to distinguish, distinguish hate speech from what I would say legitimate 
speech or uh, uh, and, and what is the threshold to, to, to take action against it. So thank you for this and also thank you for uh, reminding us of principles that are already there in this area, like the Rabat principles, but also the various models, the punitive model and the non-punitive model that you mentioned. I think this is extremely important and maybe we can come back to this. And, uh, and the non-punitive model, again, focusing on policies, education, and targeting also the youth. <laughs> the youth, we have been speaking about this uh, quite a bit uh, in these two days on, on, on the discussion. And I think this also adds to what has, says to, uh, by, uh, has been said by George, who also focused on the youth, as you, as you recall, but he also gave us also a, a third model, I would say, which is to have some kind of pact for concrete circumstances, for instance, elections, where everybody, all those concerns, agree not to use uh, hate speech uh, in, their, in their campaigns, for instance. So I think all these are, are extremely important uh, remarks. I would like uh, to uh, remind participants that they can ask uh, questions through the chat. Uh, and now we will move to the next uh, speaker, uh, Vitit, that you have served as um, as I said, a special rapporteur on many United Nations human rights bodies, as well as chaired various international commissions of inquiry. So Vitit, based on your experience, what lessons can be drawn with respect to identifying and tackling hate speech to prevent the recurrence of gross violations of human rights? And maybe here, you can add to these ideas on, on models to, to follow. So maybe you can share some examples of good practices from national prevention efforts in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, warm greetings to everyone from Bangkok. This is uh, mid to late evening in Bangkok. Um, I think the word context is very important, politically uh, context, um, uh, very, very important in terms of how to understand the political context around the hate speech. If we are faced as we are faced in the Asia Pacific region with many non-democratic countries, any laws, policies and practices that constrain freedom of expression and freedom of association and assembly should be looked at with great care. In other words, we might be co-opted under the rubric of anti-hate speech when it's actually uh, the government or the authorities trying to clamp down politically by invoking hate speech. Um, and so that is a very important consideration. Be very careful when you're faced with undemocratic regimes because they will use anything, including the invocation of hate speech to clamp down on political dissident and opposition. And I'm afraid that's uh, half of Asia that we have to deal with, in fact. So I'm very careful and circumspect about any laws and policies which claim to address hate speech in this region, unless they fulfill international standards. So let's bear in mind the international standards. There are international standards, and some have been referred to already. Number one, we have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, uh, particularly Articles 19 and 20. Article 19 is about freedom of expression, it's about possible limitations, such as national um, security perhaps, but must fulfill principles of legality, proportionality, necessity. And then we have Article 20s, which is about incitement to hatred, which might lead to discrimination and or violence. That is the universal UN threshold for laws and policies. It must be a very high threshold, not just hate, hate, but incitement. A, inciting B through hate to do something nasty to C. It's a triangular relationship, whether it happens or not, but it's a triangular relationship of hate leading possibly to discrimination and violence. Now, having said that, being very careful, we come to number two, which is a point. We have different forms of hate speech, so let's not be too general. We have the universal standards, which uh, through particularly the ICCPR articles 19 and 20, advocate that we should have laws and policies against what we can claim to be illegal hate speech, in other words, incitement to hatred that might lead to discrimination and violence. The second level is um, perhaps um, 
derogatory or toxic speech, which is not quite incitement. And that is the one taken up particularly by social platforms, apps today, particularly Facebook and others in Asia and elsewhere to address homophobia and others, which are not necessarily to the threshold of Articles 19 and 20 as cited earlier. So that is a, an area where third parties or pri pri private actors come into play, particularly the business sector, very importantly, also in Asia. And then finally, in terms of the hate speech, the type of ordinary dislike or slightly offensive speech that all of us get into sometimes in our lives, sadly, if we misunderstand or if we're not empathetic enough to others. In other words, you dislike me, which might be a sort of hate, but you're not gonna be able to deal with that through law at the state level. You're gonna deal with it through education, empathy, cross-cultural programs, inter-religious uh, programming between the young people, between religious leaders and so on. So there are different strategies coming to play here. And I want to round off the first round by saying this, there are three entry points or four entry points coming into play in terms of actions, which we can identify. Number one, let's flip it around. How about a good civil civilian population that's understanding? So much of this is going to be linked with education and cross-cultural and inter-religious inter-community programming among young people and others. In other words, back to SDG number four, global citizenship education, more cross-cultural programming from a young age. And we have a lead here from SDG4, Sustainable Development Goal 4, and many programs, much uh, around you. you know, I mean, I've been involved in community programs linking up Buddhist people with Islamic Muslim populations and so on. So I see this all the time. You don't have to look very far. Last weekend, I was at a funeral where the Christians cooperated with the Buddhists to organize the funeral. It's a very personal approach, but I thought, I was congratulating the group for being very empathetic. And that's exactly how to prevent hate speech, actually, through a very personal experience. Flip it round. The second level after the general population through good education is possible national mechanisms, good courts, good national human rights commissions, and so on. And they all deal, if they're good courts, if they're good institutions, particularly national national human rights commissions, they deal with minorities and indigenous peoples already. So let's invite them to do a bit more. I don't think they do enough yet on hate speech, but many of them do quite a lot on anti-bullying and anti-discrimination. And that's a starting point. Uh, I, I cite one Malaysian human rights commission, very brave to come out to advocate against violence in, in regard to LGBT groups. Um, very brave, even though the authorities are much less brave there. And it's only one step further to prevent hate speech against LGBTI people. So it's a starting point in terms of national human rights institution. The third level is your private actor, particularly your platforms and social apps. And this is very important because Facebook, Google, and others all have policies which go beyond the international standards uh, to counter particularly the derogatory or pejorative types of situations such as homophobia. And they can take down uh, materials. Uh, that, uh, the platforms such as uh, uh, Facebook take down millions, block millions per year, and they have an oversight committee that looks into this. But I think the jury's still out on this. Whether they take down enough is one question, which has to be proved, or whether they take down too much is also another question which has to be proved. And I heard from an oversight committee of Facebook recently that actually on some situations they take down too much. So let's prove it empirically, which means good data and good monitoring. And then the final level is the top level, it's the state, the fourth level. Well, I, I don't trust state action on some fronts if they're not democratic. In fact, in Asia, you have too many laws, too many laws which claim to deal with hate speech, claim to deal with national interest, national security. So I'm a bit hesitant about all this, but let's say the preferred approach is to abide by ICCPR articles 19 and 20, and I think the better uh, uh, examples come perhaps from the more democratic systems. Um, Australia has a, an anti-racial uh, discrimination law, uh, as well as, as anti-sex discrimination law, uh, likewise Human Rights Act in New Zealand. And there's a smart mix between civil liability and criminal liability. Anti-hate speech 
in terms of action does not have to be criminalized alone. It can be also civil action as well as administrative action, as well as social action in terms of counteraction. So let's look at these different possibilities. And uh, when you come to the state level, be very careful. They really have to prove it hard and fast that they need a law on the basis of international standards. If not, I don't really trust the laws and policies and practices at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for um, assisting us also in uh, trying to understand, again, what is hate speech. And you mentioned the different levels, the level that goes indeed to incitement, the um, or to the threshold of the Articles 19, 20 of the ICCPR, then you go into the toxic uh, speech and then the uh, ordinary dislike. Uh, so I guess we all go into some kind of hate speech in our daily life. And, uh, and also thank you again for uh, going into the levels of actions that you probably recommend. And uh, we noticed that you start with the general population and education, then you go into the national mechanisms, good court, good institutions. This is something very important to bring into the debate. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the private actors, the companies, the companies, and whether we can trust them uh, or whether they are the right uh, ones to, to start taking down contents. And there is some discussion on this, on how do they do this, uh, and whether this can be done, actually. And, and fourth, and I can see that you're extremely reluctant when you go into state actors. Be careful, you've been, say, you've been very, very, very clear about this. And this is uh, very interesting because in the other panel, uh, uh, for in the European content, uh, context, uh, many were saying, well, we need, we need state action. And here you are saying, well, important is the context because you don't want actions that would actually uh, would go against speech on the excuse that you want to, uh, to counter hate speech. And I think Eduardo also, uh, so also mentioned this, that we need to be very, very careful on the punitive model because you need to safeguard uh, the freedom of expression. Um, now, we have some questions now that are coming uh, from the audience that I have here, and that uh, we go and, um, into specific types of hate speech. Uh, uh, there is a question here uh, that uh, it is for George, but maybe the three panelists can say something of this, because I think it's probably in all continents that we have observed a rise on hate speech and discrimination during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and uh, the, the question here for George was, how was this factor into the guidelines the council is elaborating to facilitate the production of legal framework on hate speech and guide journalist standard and political behavior? This is one, but on the COVID, maybe other, other, uh, in, in the other uh, continents, maybe there is something that you can add on this. So, um, so maybe we can start with this question. And you are all welcome to step in. But George, it was specifically addressed to you, so maybe you can start. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Sylvia, thank you once again. Uh, I, 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 Ghana, you know, did not suffer the pandemic in the way that others suffered. However, uh, we took precautionary measures uh, during particularly the last year's elections. Um, uh, the social distance, wherever we went, we ensured that we provided the materials uh, to protect our people or the, our participants, you know, from um, getting infected. You know, so we did that uh, sanitizing and all that. I think it was a good opportunity to also raise the educational bar. Uh, we did that quite well, and we think that we largely succeeded. And, um, uh, but let me, I don't know whether I can touch on uh, some issues um, or I should give room to others. You know, uh, we decided together with the Media Commission of Ghana to develop guidelines uh, against hate speech. And uh, next week, we are going to meet again on this same, with the support of the Danish Embassy here in Accra. We have realized that there are two main things that drive 
hate speech or hate language as we, we, we know the term here. Fear and mistrust. Fear of probably the, 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 the political class, religious class, and mistrust that is so deeply seated here in Ghana. Mistrust of institutions. So people want to know what is happening. They don't trust the institutions, so they come up with so many things, sometimes very distasteful in their commentaries. And uh, that are the, these are the two key things that is driving hate speech in the country. And how do we resolve them? Uh, we have, like I've said, we've decided to put together a framework to guide behavior. You know, considering all the factors that uh, Professor uh, Vidit and uh, my other colleague have all said, and I mean, we are trying us also to uh, standardize the guidelines in consonance with the ICCPR and the and another international document, particularly the, F the African Union uh, protocols, uh, ECOWAS protocols. You know, so we are trying to do that. And uh, we believe strongly that if we're able to increase participation, you are able to in increase inclusiveness. You are able to expose cultures. Indeed, Ghana and the Peace Council is a critical example where we have the Christians and the Muslims and the African traditional religion believers all on the Peace Council board, taking decisions mainly by consensus. And we try to visit, for example, I am a Christian, but I go to mosque almost all the time. You see, it removes the fear factor. We are trying, last year we did something very significant in Ghana. There was this malaise, vigilantism, became an abatros ahead of the last elections, where political uh, vigilantes or so-called supporters of political parties and actors would, use, would want to use violence as a method of achieving their, their goals. Violence on, on the media, I mean, using all kinds of violent words, hits words. You know, so we have used mechanisms such as increasing dialogues, and we're able to succeed. We brought the two main political parties together, NDC, MPP, and we developed a roadmap, which is guiding behavior. We developed a code of conduct, which, though is not binding in the law courts, but has a lot of moral persuasion which worked in our opinion, because we didn't see the vigilantism thing coming up strongly in the last elections. So we have to deal with the issues of fear, with the issues of mistrust, particularly on our side of the globe, where institutions are less trusted, where politicians say one thing and do another. You see, they will, they will, they will use all kinds of tactics, including hate speech in ensuring they bring the opponents down. So we have been doing that. We think that by and large, it is really working uh, for us. And if we're able to get the framework also in place, and I strongly believe, particularly in Ghana here, in Africa, if you try to allow the state to move anything regarding uh, his speech, I'm sure they are going to muzzle uh, speech Free speech is going to be affected, and you would have people who cannot talk, who, when they talk, uh, and anything can happen to them. And it has happened here in Ghana. I heard of the last election, somebody, a journalist, was killed, unfortunately, because somebody was said to have said something on, on, on television, which packed somebody to do what he did. So I think it's very important we don't also allow the juba space for the state to lead the, the, the discussion you know, regarding uh, developing kinds of frameworks for uh, protecting uh, speech. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you for, for, these, for these additions. Yeah. Uh, sorry. 
Uh, thank you for these additions. And uh, I do have some questions coming in. Well, of course, the one on COVID, if you want to add anything from the Americas on the Asia Pacific on this. But actually, there are questions also on hate speech uh, on a gender basis. And uh, actually, there is a very specific question for Eduardo to know so whether, limits, limits uh, uh, whether the, 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 his institute has specific education programs that may aim at breaking the gender stereotypes. And then also uh, uh, from the Asia uh, Pacific region, whether this is uh, also, uh, if, if you have any uh, uh, recommendations on these issues on gender identities and how to counter uh, how to counter hate speech on that on that uh, front. So I don't know who wants to step in. Maybe Eduardo, you want to step in? Yes, Silvia, thank you. Let me say something about the COVID-19 you yeah. know, question and in, in the Americas, and then I will move uh, to, to this very important question on gender's perspective uh, um, in, 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 our, in our field or in this field. Um, COVID-19 and hate speech, frankly, and I don't want to be to be misunderstood. I mean, hate speech is a problem in Latin America, uh, and we need to work on that. Uh, I'm not saying that there is not a problem, but frankly, during during the pandemic, um, I would say that the main concern was not hate speech, but misinformation uh, mm -hmm. or disinformation. Okay, uh, not not specifically hate speech. Actually, uh, from throughout my office uh, at the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights, uh, we organized a meeting, a virtual meeting on hate speech and freedom of expression uh, because our concern and the main concern in the, in the Americas is exactly what I was uh, talking before, is uh, the problem to use the argument of hate speech that again exists, uh, but to use that argument to censor people. And our concern is how media, social media, how media platforms are censoring people uh, under the concept of hate speech that it is not a very clear concept as you said. I am stick and I, in during our meeting and our meeting is in our website, uh, um, some peoples are, uh, you know, highlighting the rabbit principles as a way to have a, some sort of specific checklist to understand when we are going to consider some speech as, as, a, as a hate speech. So those are the main concerns in the region, but including during, during, during the pandemic. And uh, talking about the activities of the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights, Yes, we have uh, many, I mean, the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights is the academic branch of the Inter-American System of Human Rights. So we have two pillars. One is education, the other is promotion in terms of education in all of our courses, including the current course that is the, the interdisciplinary course on human rights that is running this month, uh, the Institute always include a gender perspective in teaching, you know, uh, human rights. Uh, so that's that's a short answer about what the Institute is, do, is doing, but I invite people to, to see our website and see all of our work uh, in the Institute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Viti, uh, you want to? Yes. Uh, three observations and uh, four or five quick recommendations. Number one, COVID has led to not only a medical lockdown, but also a political clampdown. Why? So many countries in this region beyond use either state of emergency law or very draconian medical laws to clamp down. So what you witness is less speech. That is the reality. And hate speech arises under that because people are frustrated, particularly mm -hmm. against the authorities, and then they are clamped down. So be very careful there in terms of the paradoxes and lessons learned from COVID, but it's also an opportunity. COVID teaches us that the totality of human rights, civil, political, economic, social, cultural, go together. We need freedom of speech as well as right to healthcare and the possibility of commenting on the quality of the healthcare, which is freedom of speech. 
Secondly, where we have laws, policies on hate speech, such as in Australia or in New Zealand, uh, where the laws are not so bad, they tend to be on race hmm. and sex, the, the traditional sex uh, of male-female binary. But today we want to have broader laws that cover the possibility of preventing uh, hate speech in regard to other forms of protected characteristics, such as sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics, and so on. So yes, we want a broader coverage, but on the basis of international standards, not just race and not just sex the old way, but gender in a broader sense, gender identity, etc., as well as nationality issues, some migrant workers and non-nationals, and maybe some political differences as well in terms of even ideologies in terms of respect or openness there. So I'd like that broadening if possible, even among those that are performing well. But my mistrust is still very much there vis-a-vis -vis undemocratic systems that prevail in half the region. And please don't compare the two regions. You can't be a member of the European Union unless you prove that you're democratic. But in Asia, half of Asia is not democratic. Doesn't mean that it's bad on every front, but it's a still a fact that we have to bear in mind that they're not too nice on freedom expression on many fronts. And thirdly, as an observation, in terms of monitoring, we need to monitor the hate speech in different languages. Now, what's happening with the private sector, the apps today in terms of their oversight and their monitoring is that they don't monitor enough the multilingual situation. It's mainly in English. So we need greater transparency in terms of monitoring vis-a-vis -vis hate speech in multilingualism and multi multimodal ways of communication. So those are three observations. And finally, quick uh, recommendation. Number one, if a state is to have a law and policy against hate speech, it must comply with ICCPR and the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, uh, particularly Article 4. So it's Articles 19 and 20 of, of ICCPR and Article 4 of Convention Against Racial Discrimination. Uh, otherwise, I don't trust the laws. Sorry. Number two, for the private sector, we have guidance now, whether it be platforms or other private sector. We have the human rights general principles, guiding principles on business and human rights, which call for due diligence. So let's call upon all private firms, etc., to carry out due diligence in regard to preventing hate speech as well as attenuation. Together with self-regulation, which open to transparent monitoring, as well as uh, maybe technical solutions, but on the basis of openness and oversight that can be linked with international standards ultimately, even though they can cover issues which are broader than the international standards, for example, homophobia in general. Thirdly, national institutions, human rights commissions, GAMAC, can you get hold of them, please, and work with them? They have a gunnery, they have a, a caucus of national human rights institutions, work with them, push, push them to put the hate speech on the agenda, and they don't do it yet, even though they're dealing with minorities and uh, And then fourthly, uh, at the regional level, we have some regional institutions, such as ASEAN. ASEAN has a digital master plan, 2025, which talks about connectivity, overcoming the impact of COVID, uh, broadband access, and so on. Let's encourage these institutions at the regional level with master plans on digitalization to incorporate human rights. They don't do so enough yet. So human rights sensitive master plans. And then finally, finally the people at large, let's be guided by SDG4, global citizenship education, broad mindedness, liberal education, um, into community, into religious programs uh, of which there are many, including the ones surrounding us all the time. You don't have to look very far, but what I want also is Good counter speech. Let's enable people to group up to counter the bad speech. We haven't done that enough. So that we call for real mobilization. Thank you very much. I think this is a very good way of ending our panel. We need to, to start closing. Uh, we have run out of time. This has been a really fascinating discussion where we have gone back very much to the basics. What are we talking about? How to counter this? Go back to the importance of international law and international standards for whatever action we want to take and uh, also the importance of uh, education and, uh, and also the importance 
of good institutions, self-regulation, and national institutions. So um, I, we have no more time, but if you have one more thing that you would like to say in one second or two seconds, I don't know, Eduardo or George, would you like to add something? Yeah, maybe it's, it's, it's a repetition of what I just said. I mean, this is a problem. We need to deal with this problem for the benefit of democracy and for the benefit of the people. But we need to be aware not to create mechanisms that could be used as tool for censorship. Thank you. You said it, but I think it is extremely important to highlight it as a main takeaway of this. We have to be very careful that when we counter hate speech, we don't go into a paradox that we provoke uh, censorship. Uh, George, you have one more second if you want to add or highlight something that you think it is extremely important. Uh, Celia, I think tolerance. Uh, let us do whatever we can as global citizens to increase tolerance in our, our, our communities. I think that is key. If we're able to, to reach out more to people of different opinions, tolerate them, I think that uh, we, we will have very little work to do in terms of its uh, speech and language. Let's increase tolerance. It should be part of everyday uh, life everywhere. Thanks. Thank you, tolerance. This is an extremely important way, and it joins uh, Aviti in the, the need to create uh, counter narratives. So, tolerance would be one. Uh, Viti, you have one second, one second only to say uh, something if you want. Inclusivity and empathy, please. Okay. No exclusion, <laughs> no discrimination, no violence, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for this wonderful panel. Thank you very much to all participants for their wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And indeed, it was very interesting to see the difference between the discussion in the European context and the discussion in the international context. So thank you, everybody, for attending our two panel discussions. And of course, for those of you who attended the workshops earlier in the day, well, there are now five workshops uh, for you to attend for the rest of the day. And you can see here, they've come up there. There's one on addressing hate speech and preventing genocide. Is education the answer? We've heard a lot about education. One from, of course, Taufik Jalassi, the Assistant Director General of UNESCO yesterday. Uh, he's responsible for communication and information. And of course, education is one of the key tools. Uh, then there's another workshop coming up on ethnic and religious minorities in Europe, challenges and good practices in addressing hate speech and discrimination. Another workshop on good practices on the rights for all in addressing hate speech and of course interreligious dialogue and prevention of hate speech is another workshop and vectors of hate speech and incitement atrocity prevention and social media we've been hearing a lot about social media and what rights and responsibilities should these social media companies have in countering hate speech so I really encourage you to join one of those workshops now. Tomorrow, we have uh, another panel uh, discussion and it's gonna be very interactive. Uh, Sylvia is gonna be moderating that one again. You can see that the title is Shaping Atrocity Prevention from the Ground Up. And uh, we really need you to participate. You can see that there's going to be breakout sessions with regional initiatives. So do join us tomorrow. But for now, that's all from me and Sylvia. Thank you.